are identical to operating countries because they carry the same challenges. And I'll mention that a little bit as we go along. So um, I'll go straight to the objectives. So we're going to talk about the three phase approach to the milestones and understand some of the HRD priorities in those phases. And you did the milestones with Sean, yes, is that correct? Uh, and back in countries, okay. We're going to talk about the HRD life cycle, and I've got a nice diagram that we can talk through to describe that life cycle and some of the key activities that exist in that life cycle. We're going to talk a bit about nuclear skills and skills for nuclear, um, because there are, there's kind of two, two areas to talk about. Skills for the nuclear program, which often <laughs> are not nuclear skills at all. And then we're going to talk about um, a national workforce plan. So we, we recommend at the agency for embarking countries that, that newcomers put together a national workforce plan that scopes out for regulatory organizations and government bodies, for TSOs, for potential owner operators, that whole kind of education, training, and qualification life cycle. And we've got a copy of one, and we'll just talk through some of the key principles of it. And then we'll talk about some of the guidance we've got in the area, actually, which is pretty much the same as the last one. So, just to recap, phase one, you're going to make a decision. The milestone for phase one is you've made a positive decision that you want to go forward with a nuclear power program. Phase two is you're preparing for that program. And then phase three, you're constructing it. So I'm, I'm going to assume that you guys are fully aware of that. I know you spent a whole day on it probably tell me some stuff on it. Some of the infrastructure issues that you need to consider across all of those. So these are the, um, if you like, the components of um, the milestones approach. National position, nuclear safety, management, funding, legislation, safeguards, regulations, all the way through to industrial involvement and procurement. Um, all of these issues have human resource requirements. So it cuts across all of those. There is a specific one that we get involved with working with member states, where we try to really help them put together their national workforce plan. But they all actually have, have HR components. You need people qualified in all those areas when you decide to build a nuclear power, program, a nuclear power plant. So here you can see. Um, kind of a breakdown, a schematic of the different phases and the milestones. And 10 to 15 years is a period, typically, that when we, when we break down the time scales. That's the kind of sum that we come to. And that's actually, that seems a lot, but 10 years is not a long time to get everybody qualified and ready. Um, so the reason that arrow is put there is because we would recommend that you start thinking about, even here, your national workforce plan, even before you've got to phase one. So we really encourage um, government organizations to do their planning, start thinking about their planning here. Because in some cases, they have to build universities or they have to develop university capability. They have to build schools, technical vocation. Not all the time, but in some cases. So we would encourage this, this thought process around your workforce plans and for embarking countries very early on. So we, we encourage you to have a national HR strategy that you can then roll out across that period. Um, so these plans we, we talk about you developing, we, we kind of just remind the member states that the plans aren't being developed for us, they're being developed for the member states. Often member states give us a plan and think, well, that's it, we've, we've given the plan, although it's some kind of sign off or gold star stamp from the IAA. And to be, to be honest, we look at these plans, but they're not, not for us. They're meant to be living plans that you keep alive and evolve. They're meant to identify gaps in your national and regional arrangements. So often, if you're involved in developing workforce plans, you should be brutally honest with yourselves about where the potential gaps are. If you think you're going to have a shortfall of vocational skills or technical skills or competencies, this plan should be identifying it. The worst thing that can happen is you, you come to the agency with a really rosy plan and say, oh, this looks fantastic, when you know that there's gaps in it. Um, because if you came to us with a, a really good plan, we'd be highly suspicious that you haven't done your job properly. 
because every country in the world has gaps in their workforce plan by the nature of what we're trying to do. It's an evolving, changing thing. So we're just trying to get the message over. These plans, you have to be really tough on yourselves. Um, you may need to have a different approach for different phases. So your workforce plan for phase one you know, will be different for phase two, will almost certainly be different for phase three. And that's what we see. We, we experience that even recently with the UAE, who invested a huge amount of money in their capability program and in Belarus. So um, this message about be realistic and find the gaps, it's a vehicle to find the gaps in your natural arrangements for yourselves. There are no off-the-shelf solutions. Some, I know when I first came to the agency, we had some calls from some countries. Can you, can you give us a, a kind of model plan to, to develop? And we've got a template, but the, we can give you that template. But the truth is, there are no off-the-shelf solutions because each country has its own unique circumstances. Because it has its own unique education model, social model, that has to plug into it. Um, We'll go into this during the session, but there, there's two kind of categories we try to talk about. There's nuclear skills, so the nuclear knowledge and skills you need to write a safety case for your plan, for your regulators. There's the nuclear skills and knowledge you need if you're in the regulatory organisation, because we've got a bunch of you in here. So you understand how to interpret these nuclear documents. They're nuclear skills. Skills for a nuclear programme, so you're going to build a massive construction project. So you need, you need bricklayers, you need construction workers, construction engineers. You need electrical, mechanical design engineers who may have built hospitals, schools, roads. They don't need nuclear skills. They're, they're skills for your nuclear program. One of the most vital elements that you'll have, and indeed embark, new, new build countries are finding one of the most challenging areas, is to get highly qualified nuclear welders. So nuclear grade welders are welders that can weld to a very, very high standard around the world. Many of them have no nuclear qualification whatsoever because they're going to weld on a construction site. But they're nuclear grade welders because the quality of their welding is really top class. So there's a really good example of a nuclear uh, skills for a nuclear program are nuclear, nuclear grade welders. If you speak to a nuclear grade welder, they have no nuclear qualifications. They're welders. But it's for a nuclear program. As opposed to a design engineer working in the regulator who has a huge amount of nuclear knowledge and skills because they have to assess this. So there are two categories you need to consider, and we'll talk about them as we go through. Now, the phase three stuff, workforce plans for operating running plants are really easy, because we've got 450 of them, 440, running around the world. Some of these plants have run, 81 plants out of that 440 have been running for, for 40 years, which is quite an amazing design and engineering feat when you think about it, these plants were built and designed 40 years ago to the specification, and we still consider they can run safely for another 10, 15 years. That's a fantastic achievement for the nuclear workforce, actually, and a statement to the quality of the people that we have in the nuclear sector. But nevertheless, lots of people kind of get a bit, embarking countries come to talk to us about the operating structures, and our advice is, look, don't worry about the operating structures. When you get halfway through phase three, you can have a look at that, because there's hundreds of plants that work perfectly well with lots of different kind of staffing models and skills models. So phase three is pretty easy. That's the message. Kind of late phase three into operating. Lots of models you can take. And indeed, many of the vendors you're working with, my experience is most new build countries um, will kind of take the vendor's recommended model because that's what the vendor's using in their own countries and work perfectly well on those design plans. Sometimes the numbers may vary. But nevertheless, the kind of the requirements in terms of structures pretty much match what you will need, certainly for the first few years of operation. Um, yeah, so things to bear in mind, um, the number of units you want will really influence your kind of workforce planning. The type of contract will as well. So this, this, these, these contracts kind of build, own, operate, or build, own, operate, transfer, Con these turnkey contracts, as we call them, um, they're kind of fairly new to the nuclear sector. So a really good example. Anybody from Turkey here? No. no so Turkey are, are looking at a, a build, own, operate contract with um, their vendor. Effectively, they're looking to build a plant in the country. The, 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 the vendor will build it with their staff, not local staff. They'll operate it with their own staff from their host country. And they'll run it for 25 years and sell the electricity back to Turkey. 
So that kind of contract's really new, and there are slight variations on that, build, own, operate, transfer after five years or ten years. Lots of different models being touted by all the different vendors, not just one, one vendor. This is a fairly new contractual arrangement in the nuclear sector. Traditionally, if we go back 20, 30 years, nuclear plants were base load plants built by governments for national interests. Um, they weren't built to be flexible, load following, like a lot of them are now. And they certainly weren't built to be kind of operated and owned by vendors. So this is a fairly new model for the nuclear sector, and that will really impact your workforce planning model. Because if the vendor is going to staff it or half staff it, that needs to be factored into your national plan. I will add, actually, just as an aside, that this contract is not new in most industries. Lots of, lots of manufacturing industries have used these kind of build and operate models for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. It's just new to the nuclear sector. The level of industrial involvement is really important. Again, it's linked to the um, type of contract. Do you want a massive local involvement from uh, your, your local regions, and your national countries, or do you just want them to come in and build it and give you the, sell you the electricity or work in partnership with them to get the electricity? I, my experience, I was involved in the Hinkley C project for a number of years. We were pitching to get about 65 to 70% of the local industrial involvement all, the, all the, the, the plant supply chain from local industrial involvement. That was one of the, um, that was one of the promotional um, ideas we had in, in gaining local regional government support. So some countries, um, the level of industrial involvement will really impact it. And if you bear in mind that 20 to 1 or 100 to 1 impact, how many people are employed in the local regions, that, that's really good, but you have to think, if you're going to do that, you have, the, the, the industrial involvement source has to be qualified to support your plan. So if you're going to get your, your supply chain capability, you know, your outage maintenance contracts, your day-to-day -day servicing and capability from your local regions, that, those local regions need to be able to supply that. So they may need training and education programs in place to support that, schools, et cetera, et cetera. So your level of industrial involvement will influence your national workforce plan. We would highly recommend that the roles, responsibilities, and functions of all the stakeholder organizations, even if they're not established, you really understand what you are going to need in phase one, as early as phase one. And um, we really would promote that you think about this kind of sustainable workforce program, because what we've already encountered with some embarking countries, new, new build countries, is they put in place programs to get people ready. They've either lost those people or they've realized that they had gaps in their national plan. They're now you know, urgently outsourcing from different countries nuclear skills to come and help bridge that short-term gap because they didn't apply a sustainable long-term workforce capability to their planning. Yeah? Boot. Build, own, operate. Sorry. Because uh, we're nuclear. We love acronyms, don't we? We just love them. Build, own, operate, transfer. So here's a really good cycle, actually. I'm going to talk about this long-term HRD recruitment cycle. This cycle applies equally for an operator. But I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to come from here, actually, because it's easier. Excuse me. Because I don't have a pointer. So this covers recruitment, what you actually need on the ground, and um, how you're going to lose people from your organization, and how you're going to cycle them back in. So um, let's just talk about recruitment. OK, how are you going to, this, this is, this is your pool of people you need. It looks fairly straightforward, this, but there's some kind of little tricks in here. Vendor options. So the vendor will come with lots of different options. Some vendors can help train your regulators. Some vendors will help train all your operating staff. Some vendors will offer to. So the vendor, typically, because they're already running nuclear power programs, they have great potential. They already have universities, colleges, vocational capability. They have facilities that you can go and get experience on. So they're a great option to consider. Of course, what's the challenge with that, the option of using vendors? What's the challenge if you let your vendor do it all? Language. Language is one, yeah. So that's really interesting. So to give you an example on that, um, Vietnam were thinking of building two, two, two twin unit sites, one in North Vietnam, one in South Vietnam. One was going to be built by a um, Russian vendor. One was going to be built by a Japanese vendor. So the, the operators, so, so they're going to have two separate work pools. 
The operators who are going to work on the Russian plant were going to Moscow to get trained. The operators who, uh, in, who support the build, the operators who were going to work on the Japanese plant were going to Tokyo to get trained. And their language on the build sites was going to be English. So the operators had to speak Vietnamese, Japanese, and English on one site, Russian, Vietnamese, and um, English on another site. So just an example, there's a complexity. Okoloto, the plant in Finland, um, and when I, I was there when they were commissioning some of their outside plant, actually. And um, Okoloto employed a team of about 15 interpreters to, in, their, in their control rooms when they were commissioning, because they had 60 different nationalities on the project. 60, six zero different nationalities on the project. So um, language is a real challenge in this HRD program, definitely. So what's the other challenge with vendors? What's a big challenge? Uh, well, there's a culture, yeah. So there is a culture. But you would hope, you would expect a vendor, the vendor organization that you're going to has a pretty strong nuclear safety culture, which is what you want to immerse your people in. You would expect that. So, but that, that is a challenge, different culture, yeah. It, it, country culture, certainly. What's the big challenge if you're going to give it all to a vendor? Yeah, well, that, okay. That's, yeah, that's another big challenge. Sorry, I missed that. So knowledge transfer. So you, if you want to take ownership of this plant and your vendor has got all that kind of secret knowledge, then you're going to be limited, aren't you? You're going to be beholding to them for a long time. Have we seen that on some plants? So what, what, but there's one really big challenge if you give it all to a vendor. Well, yeah, sustainability is a challenge, yeah? Well, what's the big one? The cost. How much is it going to cost to do all this? Because the vendor, look, let's be really honest. The vendor's not doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They're doing it because they want your money. So it's going to, you, the vendor can give you all that, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. So recruitment options. Education pipelines, we talked about vocational pipelines. Existing electricity industry. So this is a really important one. <coughs> your, your countries all, and embarking countries, you must have electricity supply organizations. You must have grids, because you wouldn't be building a nuclear power plant to plug it into unless you had a decent grid to put it on. So by, by, by that, you must have people who, who manage it, who run it, who fix it when it breaks down. So you already have an existing electricity industry that has most of the core skills you need, certainly in technician space. You must be running, Nigeria, you're on fossil fuel plants, yes? We've got a, a team from Nigeria here. So you must have coal, gas, oil, yeah. Yeah, so, so you, you must be training your staff to run those. But you, they'll be in a control room. It's not a nuclear control, but it's a control room managing the boilers, managing the furnaces, managing the oil systems, the cooling systems. So you already have that kind of psyche running in your, in your country. That's a great asset to have when you start about planning. Existing nuclear facilities. I mentioned earlier research facilities, medical physics. Lots of people go from medical physics into radiation protection. It's quite a common movement, actually. Um, ironically, because nuclear more normally pays more than the health services, so the medical physicists come over and join the nuclear industry. So you have lots of sources of recruitment and expat external sourcing. Recently, I was in the UAE, where they've got a lot of expats coming in from South Africa, from the UK, and from the US, supporting their initial back end of phase three activities. So you've got lots of different vendor recruitment options, from vendors to expats. So when you put your plan together, you need to think about that. And that will vary, different phases, different requirements. So if you think about this bucket we've got here, we've got at the top, we've got external resources, agency workers, specialist consultants, kind of topping up your pool of suitably qualified and experienced resource. And we would say that this is really underpinned by competent initial training and development. So your pool, as it were, is going to have input from all of these. It's going to be underpinned by knowledge management and a SAT-based training program. So knowledge management is going to inform all of that. And, and, and as James said, you really want to be thinking, especially with vendor options, about making sure you've got the right knowledge management, knowledge transfer. Um, so you're going to lose people through res resignations, retirements. If you think about, this is a 10 or 15 year project, didn't we? So if you take somebody who's experienced and qualified in their, in their mid-40s, you know, by the time the, the plant may get to the back end of phase three, if you've been successful and done it in 15 years, they'll be 60 years old, they may be looking to retire. So you have to think about retirement and resignations in your plan. 
and you need to think about the knowledge transfer and that process. Attrition, so you need to think about how many people you're going to lose to other organizations and other operators. If you train up all these young people into your program, and then a petrochemical organization says, hey, you guys, you've got all the right qualifications, we'll double your salary if you come and work for us. How are you going to manage that process? That's a real challenge for lots of embarking countries. And internal movement. So we would encourage, this is a real positive movement actually, we would encourage internal movement as much as possible, in, certainly in phase two and phase three. Um, because the, the more broader your experience and your workforce gets in this nuclear power program, the more effective they're going to be as you move into phase three and back end of phase three. So that's your kind of recruitment plan. You have to consider all of those. That was, so you have to think about that in terms of life cycle. And, and your float of your sweat resource will change as you need it. But it's a living, kind of breathing model that you need to develop. So what we've done here, we've mapped out in the three phases. Just These aren't exact. Some people will change these. But some of the key elements. So we've got, on the bottom, we've got HR activities. On the top, we've got some key programs that tie into it. So early in phase one, you're going to staff your NEPIO because you're going to establish that to start thinking about, do you want to build a nuclear power program? You're going to even consider, OK, even at this early stage, we would recommend you consider some initial workforce planning. Certainly for the phase one piece, have you got the NEPIO? Have you got the right people helping you? Have you got the right technical support organizations helping you in the NEPIO? But even thinking about, well, if we go into phase two and phase three, what, what are the implications? So this initial workforce plan may help inform the government make the national decision, because they may see that broader economic benefit that you're going to get from it. So that would include identifying the HR investment as you start to develop a localization strategy. And it would include um, really preparing strategies for nuclear safety, security, and safeguards as part of that workforce plan in that comprehensive report that you're going to give your government here to make a decision. So this is kind of 15 years at this left side of this scale before you take your reactor critical. So if you go to phase two, so we're going to assume you've made, yes, we're going to build a nuclear power plant. So you're going to start to establish a regulatory body. You may even start to consider who the owner operator is going to be and start to establish an owner operator nuclear power program project team. So at that time, you're going to staff your regulatory body. Then you're going to staff your project team. Then you're going to start thinking about your education and training infrastructure. Is your education training infrastructure going to be able to support this development and phase three development? Um, so then there's a whole host of HR activities along here. Identifying any investment you need, maintaining your workforce plans as you kind of move through establishing agreements with foreign governments and suppliers, getting your technical requirements ready for the first plant, getting ready to kind of do the feasibility study, complete the feasibility study, and then maybe start to go out to tender at this stage. So even at that stage, you're thinking about all the other workforce plans that sit underneath that. And then in phase three, so you've picked your plant, or you've completed your negotiations, so you know what you're going to build, you know where you're going to build it. Um, you're going to start thinking about your licensing, your construction, your fuel load, your commissioning, and then a transfer, if it's going to be transferred. So sitting underneath that, you've got to start implementing all your policies. You need a training program to support testing and commissioning. You need to get that early on so that those people who are going to operate the plant up here go through the commissioning to capture all those lessons on the plant. You're going to have an tra on-site training center. You're going to make sure you've got knowledge management processes in place to capture all that essential knowledge during commissioning. You're going to you'll have a simulator in there. You want your operators trained really early. The best, world's best practice is to have your first batch of operators ready to form part of the commissioning teams so that they can be actively involved in that commissioning. Then you're authorizing your plant staff here. And all this time, you're managing this workforce plan, upgrading it, thinking about what do we need when we take the reactor critical. So it kind of runs through all those steps in the, mil in the milestones on phase three. Not all the steps are, uh, these will vary from country to country. So some of these you know, may be in different sequences, but the purpose of these last three slides are just to give you an indication of the magnitude of the planning you need to do to do this process. So let's just look at some um, profiles in terms of numbers of people. This excludes vendor, supply chain support, and construction staffing. So we'll do construction staffing in a minute. And um, so here's a picture of um,
the NEPIO, the regulator, and the TSOs supporting the NEPIO, the regulator, and the owner-operator. So to, in total, it's, it's only about 350 people when you look at this. And you can see um, the NEPIO here, this yellow line, that kind of starts about year 11, year 10, and then grows to its peak of about 150 people for a typical twin unit site. You can see the pink line here is the kind of owner-operator technical support organization, which gradually over time builds up. Often this is contractorized, so you'll buy this in from a specialist vendor. You can see um, owner-operator headquarters staff, so maybe 50-ish, the headquarters. So these are very much the kind of off-site support stuff. And you can see the regulator here in the black dotted line goes to about 120 maybe between unit sites with no, H with no other nuclear organization. So it's not a lot really, not a lot of people. So let's look at the twin unit profile on the site itself, which goes up to about 5,500 people. And again, this varies depending on how the national models developed and how the country developed it. But you can see professional management staff, maybe project management staff, really, civil engineering, electrical, mechanical, INC, and then operations. And again, the operations <coughs> kicks in quite late, actually, as you can see. But the bulk workforce is the civil construction and the mechanical, electrical, and INC work. This is a pretty common curve. You see most new plants being built around the world will have similar curves. The numbers might be different and the shape is slightly different, but they're not far off. So you, you, get, you can get the indications that when we talk about skills for nuclear and nuclear skills, my thing doesn't work. This, this, um, the blue and the yellow curves, the bulk stuff, nearly 3,000 of each, they're kind of skills for the nuclear program. They're not necessarily nuclear skills. Some countries will be challenged to get these skills because you may also be building hospitals, roads, schools, big construction projects, airports, dams. So you may have to compete financially with those organizations, or the vendor may, to source these numbers, which ultimately will lead back to the bill the vendor gives you to stuff that. So that's worth bearing in mind as well. So just to kind of look at the NEPIO, so we've got some NEPIO graphs here, phase one, phase two, and phase three. We would expect, um, oh, sorry. <coughs> you can see that we don't have a lot of people in the NEPIO. Maybe through this pre-feasibility in here, they start to fade off. Maybe there's some extension in multiple units, but it's not a lot of people. <laughs> if you look at the regulator, as in, typically the NEPIO falls off, a lot of them join the regulatory functions, which is a common practice we see in many countries. And again, you can see, um, should be another, yeah, two kind of little sub peaks here. So the regulator may top up their staff during the kind of initial phase here when they're talking to the government about nuclear plants, and certainly during this phase when they're issuing construction licenses and um, operating licenses towards the end of um, phase three. So there's kind of peaks and troughs. Might go up to 400 people, some organizations. Some organizations that already have an existing nuclear regulatory function have slightly less. But you can see there are kind of pretty common trends across most of these organizations around the world. An owner-operator. So owner-operator, green line, really. We have, we have a few supports up here, but it starts to take off here. And, and again, you know, if you look at this, it's kind of six years before the plant goes into commissioning that they're really starting to stuff up because they want these, these people involved in this commissioning. They want them qualified and trained. So that gives you an indication of the kind of time frames involved for um, the NEPIO, the regulator, owner, operator. There are obviously other groups. There's technical support organizations, depending on what your model is. Um, and there's kind of links to vendors and supply chain. We haven't put them up here. So this builds on something I said earlier, really. Um, this contractual arrangement is really important. Um, the majority of your project staff in phase three could be vendor staff or their contractors. Um, the skills required to support the nuclear program will be a range of engineering, project management, and construction skills. And um, nuclear skills during this construction phase will be very limited. And in fact, non-nuclear science and engineering degree qualifications are often preferable to nuclear specific 
for lots of these construction organizations, INC especially, INC engineering, mechanical electrical engineering, rather than nuclear engineering. You need a few nuclear engineers when you're operating, a few to help with the design stuff. But for the big construction projects, you want big civil engineer organizations. And the, the time frame for that, so um, as you go into phase three, you're going to be recruiting and training, training, commissioning, commissioning. And all. So there's a lot of kind of crossover, and you, your planning for your people needs to take into account all those three curves in terms of the construction and commissioning timescale, because you want them all ready for the operating. OK, um, so to help member states do this, we encourage them to develop a national workforce plan. And um, we would sit down with those countries and help them develop that plan. We also run a couple of um, training courses that you're all eligible and welcome to come to. We have um, a number of, we have a team actually works in Sean's group. Um, and they can develop, they have some models that you can use, digital models to build a national workforce plan. So it's a three to five day course. I think we're running one for Nigeria. We may have run one recently, I can't remember. But we've certainly run them for um, most of the embarking countries and, and a few countries that are kind of even in phase one to help them build their plan. So it's a, it's a three to five day course where we take a team of people from the host country, or sorry, from the embarking country and bring them to Vienna. And we train them on this software tool where you can build a model and then we give you the licenses to take back to your country, and then you can keep running the model. It's extremely useful. Um, in fact, on Twitter, I saw on Twitter the other day, there was a feed about it. So if you check your Twitter from the IAA, you'll see it. So um, part of that training course is we, we teach you how to build this plan. So I'm just going to go through what the plan looks like, what we would recommend. So it's, it's not a fixed template. <coughs> you can adjust it to, to your national needs. As I said earlier, it's something that needs regular update and evolution. It needs to cover all the phases. Mm. And it's a national program. Um, it needs to consider the project requirements and the operational requirements. And significantly, many countries are using this modeling tool together with this plan to work out the costs. How much is it going to cost for all these people? Because that's often a factor in making the decision, yes, we're going to go for a nuclear, or no, we're not. So this um, software program tool that we give you can help do the cost analysis for the HR capital. So the typical content, we, it has the introductory stuff about your program roadmap, your timescales, but it includes um, your goals and assumptions as well. Then we talk about the HR requirements itself. So it talks about the NEPIO. So we say, what's the structure? What are the roles and responsibilities? What are the competencies? How many people do you need in each? We repeat that for the owner operator and the regulatory body. It includes the education strategy. And the training strategy, as well as the requirements, so understand what you've got right now, understand what you need in the future, understand what the vendor can give you. And, um, and then it kind of talks about recruitment, qualification, and selection. Recruitment strategies, candidate selection process, really important, actually. Um, increasingly so, this kind of behavioral piece and this ethics piece. Um, qualification approach and strategy, the lead times by job categories, and you know, it's recruitment from existing national industries, as I mentioned, the petrochemical industry or the existing electricity supply industry. HR approaches, how much are you going to pay them? How are you going to retain them? What are you going to offer them in terms of succession and career management? So these, these kind of three issues, retain, you know, paying them, retaining them, and offering them succession are key to holding on to that workforce. So if you think you've, you've done all this work, you've paid all this money to educate, train, and qualify these people, the last thing you want to do is lose that investment. Typically, to, to qualify, certainly a reactor operator, it's about half a million US dollars per reactor operator. So that's a massive investment. Massive investment. If you lose five or six reactor operators, it's a couple of million dollars you've lost. So having re, re, paying them enough or having a pay structure that meets their needs and holds them in your organization. Having some kind of benefit scheme that helps retention. It may be education schemes for their families. It may be health care for their families. It may be enhanced holiday, flexible working, all these different things. Succession and career management. So you really want to offer these people that you've invested so heavily in a viable future career 
across a number of roles. So traditionally, um, because I'm quite old, you were just happy to get a good secure job that had a good pension and you had a job for life. But lots of the embark lots of the workforce people now, the younger graduate generation, they kind of might not want to just do one thing the rest of their lives. They may want to do lots of different things. So you have to think about how do we how do we create an environment that that gives our people that, that succession in career management throughout their whole worker life cycle. Because that's a massive investment you've made. And of course one of the real challenges managing project delays. Um, I had some personal experience with this at Hinkley. Hinkley C was delayed twice. Um, the first time we delayed the project, we had about 800 people on the new nuclear build organization. We had to reduce that to 400, so we had to redistribute those people into the existing generation organization. Some people sadly left or went to other more conventional project organizations. Um, we then restuffed up to a couple of hundreds, about 650. We then had to lose another 200 because we got onto a second delay period. So we, we had to kind of be really creative about those project delays and how we redistributed those staff and then how we brought them back. Um, so you will need to consider in your workforce plan how do you manage those project delays. Knowledge management, um, you need to make sure in your plan you, it's a golden thread that runs through lots of stuff actually, knowledge management. We, try, we kind of sometimes box it up into one place, but actually every piece of the nuclear sector has to consider knowledge management, whether you're nuclear safety or whether you're emergency planning. You need to make sure you capture, transfer, and promote knowledge across all these people in your organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Well, we, um, that's, that's a good question. We, we use the workforce plan, the output from your plan. We use the numbers in the financial modeling for putting together the business case for a new nuclear build program. We encourage member states to use those numbers. We don't. But we don't, because the, the, the fundamental reason we don't include costs in this is because it's, the costs vary so much. To school and educate somebody in, say, the United States, costs completely different to school and educate somebody in South Africa or in the UK or in Russia. So um, the cost variations across all of these are huge. So we couldn't really give you a definitive number, like how much would it cost to educate a person in secondary school or primary school, because it's based on your national model. So is there any idea that we can ask for this plan well, th th there is a group, the PASS group, um, and they do a lot of financial modeling. So there is a group that you can sit down and work with, and they can help you plug your numbers into their models. So there is, we don't do it here, but there is a group that can help you with financial modeling about the economic cost of nuclear. So I can give you that later if you want. They're, you can get their contacts, because they can do that. In fact, they, help, they work with us when we do the courses for the National Workforce Modeling Plan. They actually work with us in the they run the course with us, and they help the, co the country structure their workforce plans on the spreadsheets, etc. Okay, um, here's some lessons that we've learned. Um, plan early. You want the NEPIO and regulators qualified really before you went to phase two, and for the owner operator before commissioning. You need to understand your education model. Um, and the program needs from designing, engineering, commissioning, and operations. So you really need to understand your education training models and how they plug in. We would actively encourage all embarking countries to, use, to maximize the vendor capability um, through training and experience. Some, some vendors offer some comments of stuff for several years. Myself, um, I was involved in the PWR project in the UK in the early 90s. So I spent 12, 12 months in the States, six months in France looking at how they operated their PWRs, because I came from a gas reactor background. Hugely valuable, those are comments, and um, we would recommend you consider incorporating those into your vendor arrangements, but understand the costs. They also can offer specific technical training. Lots of the vendors have um, dedicated nuclear training facilities that you can use as part of your preparation for your own 
people. <clears throat> Maintain a flexible approach to staff development. So that movement from construction to operation and the different role changes really encourage that because you've invested significantly in those people in phases one and two. Um, stakeholder expectations and management. So it's really important that the trade unions, the regulators, and indeed other nuclear operators in some countries are really kind of supportive of what you're trying to do. So you're kind of working in partnership with them. Certainly the trade unions in many countries, this is a great source of employment, future security for some of their members. So they could be a really strong ally in that process. Other nuclear operators, if you want to kind of minimize the loss of employees to these operators, we would advise you very early on to come into some agreements where you don't poach each other's staff, etc. That's a common common uh, agreement that you see in lots of countries now. Um, knowledge management and technician succession, technical succession management links to recruitment. So yeah, this is really important. Um, you need to think about if you've got some really good engineers, electrical, mechanical, INC engineers on your project, who you want to retain, or you want to retain their knowledge. You need to think about putting a plan in place to capture their knowledge, or get a trainee in place alongside the more experienced engineer so that there's some technical succession. I don't mean management succession of leaders, I mean technical succession, two different things. Okay, and as ever, we've got lots of guidance. Um, certainly the workforce planning, education, training, the documents are very closely related. And the nuclear power human resource modeling tool is the tool that I mentioned. Um, and as I said, if anybody's interested in attending a course or having a course run for your country, then through the technical cooperation department, we can arrange that, or we can run a course for you. And I would strongly recommend it. It's a very good course. And we've got the digital hub that we'll have some information on. Samuel is not here. So I'm going to ask him if we're linking there. We were trying to link the modeling tool onto the hub. I'm not sure we can do that yet, but that's the kind of end goal. OK, so um, we talked about the three phases and um, the milestones. We talked about this HRD recruitment life cycle, so recruit, develop, and then lose, and how that's a continuous cycle. We talked about nuclear skills and skills for nuclear, um, which is a key understanding, really, for embarking countries. Uh, we talked about the major content of the plan, and we talked about some of the guidance. OK, any questions? I know I've kind of flown through that, but yes? Thank you very much. In most cases, people are resources to go to the development of course planning. It's a kind of confusing. How can you give it to me? So, human resource development and workforce planning. So, you would really say that workforce planning is a subset of human resource development. So, you know, in human resource development, you've got education, training, workforce planning, knowledge management. So you've got all those aspects of, of human resource development. Workforce planning is kind of one of those subsets, if you like, under the umbrella of, of HR, human resource development. OK. So if you give me the question, 13 and 14. Yeah. 